So today I was given the task uh, to do an introduction to machine learning. Um, so obviously this is not going to be possible to teach you machine learning over two hours. Um, and there was already a lecture within the uh, summer student program uh, by uh, Glenn Cohen. Um, I should have listed here, yes. Um, that uh, has already introduced some of the, the subject. Uh, here we'll go over the, uh, really the essentials and things that really you need to, uh, to have in mind when you develop machine learning uh, applications uh, um, at colliders. And I will go through those essentials, then come to what we do uh, in terms of machine learning at colliders, what are the uh, uh, common pitfall way developing ap uh, applications, and then also um, some of the specifics uh, of data science at Collider. Here first I will uh, just uh, list out this uh, living review that has uh, a, an exponentially growing list of references of work um, for machine learning in high energy physics. Um, you can refer to this for many of the problems that I will touch on. All right, so the way this course is, or this lecture will go is that I will first do a quick introduction of physics at the Large, large Hadron Collider. Uh, you probably had already such a course and lecture, uh, or you will have. Uh, so I will only talk about really the essentials, things that you have to have in mind while developing data science and data, uh, deep learning application for, 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 for Collider. <laughs> Again, on the second part, not in depth, but really a glimpse at uh, some of the machine learning uh, uh, stones uh, and things in the landscape of, of this uh, very complex and evolving field of machine learning and deep learning. Um, quickly, some motivation for using machine learning in high energy physics. And then on the fourth part, talking about the deep learning in the high energy physics data pipeline. Some of this uh, you might be actually already working on. And then finishing with collider-specific um, part of artificial intelligence, deep learning, and whatnot. Um, and uh, this could be very interactive. If you want to ask questions for people who are connected or for the record, uh, you can uh, click on the red button, ask your question when it's uh, lit on, and then unmute afterwards, or mute afterwards. Um, I think the timing is OK. You can ask questions during the, during, uh, during the lecture. Uh, at some point, I will actually stop questions if we want to finish on time. But you can always ask. Uh, I will, might not be responding <coughs> until the end. All right. Quickly, uh, through the high-energy physics endeavor, uh, probably something that was already uh, introduced and you are well aware of, but really quickly, now what we're talking about here, and, and there is also many other accelerators and many experiments around CERN. Uh, the main one is the LHC. 100 and so kilo, uh, meters underground uh, across the uh, Swiss uh, French border, uh, just here. Um, and uh, where we collide uh, beams of protons and also heavy ions uh, from time to time. But actually, we're colliding uh, not protons, but really quarks. And that's really, at a certain level, it's actually a gluon collider. Uh, because when you get into the uh, elements of the protons that do collide, they're actually at high energy, this is mostly gluons that are seen by the, uh, when the beams interleave. So that's uh, more a gluon collider than a hadron collider. Anyways, uh, one of the key aspects here is that uh, because of the compositeness of the protons, we don't know exactly what's going on in the longitudinal plane or the longitudinal axis. But we know that in the transverse axis, you know, energy is conserved, not in the forward backward plane. So that's something to keep in mind. This is important for the, uh, for the uh, uh, coordinates that we use in high energy physics. One key aspect that you're probably aware of is the standard model of particle physics and also the extensions that we'll talk about later on. What the key aspect here is that we actually do have something that uh, we can draw a large amount of simulation from. Not uh, the same in uh, cats and dogs, where there is no uh, standard model of cats and dogs. Uh, so we cannot just generate data. Uh, we have to take it, label it. Here we can have a large amount of sample, which is a, a key place in science uh, where we have a very, uh, very accurate uh, simulator. 
All right, now the size, the size of the challenge in, in LHC for most of the, uh, the analysis, unless you wanna study the bulk and things that are really, uh, you know, the common science, then here the things that are of interest, uh, uh, the Higgs processes, for example, and all the exotic uh, processes will be down there where you have uh, in the log scale, the probability of creating one such process in the, uh, during the collision. And we're looking for very small, very rare uh, signal uh, in, in, you know, um, within a large amount of, uh, of background. And here, what is uh, the key aspect is that there is a huge amount of selection uh, that needs to be done, uh, and actually in, uh, in a very short amount of time. We'll see that about afterwards. Now, beyond the Higgs um, discovery and measuring of the Higgs property, uh, we know that the standard model is an effective model, uh, that there is something beyond. But what is beyond, there is a, a, a humongous amount of uh, different models. And here, uh, we're in the process of uh, trying to figure out what is the next model that fits the data or vice versa. Um, so there is a lot of unknown on what to look for when we were looking for the Higgs. We knew that there was something that uh, looked like the Higgs we, and the mass was the uh, unknown. Now, not only the mass is unknown, but the process and the particles and whatnot is completely unknown. So this is a key aspect when we come back to anomaly detection uh, that is uh, also um, uh, uh, widespread in industry, but uh, very uh, key here for, for, for discovery at the LHC. Quickly about the pipeline for high energy physics uh, process. Uh, now you start with the, uh, you know, the, the, acce the accelerate, and this thing is super weird, never works, all right. Um, Point here. All right. So the accelerator here, the LHC colliding, and then a bunch of detectors, uh, LHC, uh, Atlas, LHCB, CMS, and ALICE, uh, for the main ones. A triggering system that is able to uh, 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 accept the one petabyte per second amount of data and then, and then reduce this to a couple of uh, kilohertz uh, to the uh, computing centers where this is uh, stored on tape and actually distributed to tier zero, tier ones around the world, and on the LHC grid for people to access uh, the data where and there is a, a, an almost online processing of this data. At the same time, the LHC grid is used for simulating data um, out of the world, and then we converge on usually a plot like this where you have a, a background and, and something coming out on top, um, or some, something unexpected. Um, now the key point here is that uh, it's a long chain and, and you would say, well, machine learning and deep learning only happens here. Well, actually, it happens all the way through the process chain uh, or it could happen. We see emerging uh, applications all, all over the place. So um, that's why actually this, uh, we have now a series of machine learning lecture uh, for, for the summer students because most of the projects now involve machine learning to some level because all of this involve ML at these days. All right, um, triggering, I don't wanna go through this. Uh, this part, well, actually I'll, I'll go through this. Um, the key part here is that you have the detector that produced uh, that produce about like one petabyte of data per second and then a full hardware uh, triggering event that uh, you know, goes down from the 40 megahertz to 100 kilohertz about sent to a computer farm. This is the overall uh, design of the trigger for the experiment. And then uh, another rough selection uh, goes to, um, to tape and, and everything that is uh, kept here is kept, of course, but everything that is discarded is guarded forever and, and that's why triggering is a, a, a key aspect of the experiment at a large hadron collider and something where you have to be extremely careful uh, in the decision that you make and also, as you realize, that going from 40 megahertz to a couple of kilohertz, you have to do this extremely fast. Um, and that has some aspect on the way you run models, uh, not on the way you train them, but on the way you run them uh, in this whole pipeline. The reconstruction is, uh, of, of the data is uh, a key aspect again, um, where you go from the detected data, this is just exactly a simple uh, uh, dump of, of uh, all the the modules there, there is a local reconstruction where you transform this into local energy deposition. Then the clustering that goes uh, from this local reconstruction to particle level representation. And then 
this bunch of particles can actually be uh, coming from uh, an initial particle created at the origin of the collision. And that's why you have like clustering, especially for jets. Uh, so a bunch of those particles are actually associated with the same similar object. It's called a jet and then high level feature. Now the key point here is that <clears throat> this is a computing intensive uh, set of tasks. Um, most of the time you can actually surrogate those with deep learning, um, uh, either for better quality or for faster execution. Now the key aspect also is uh, that you have multiple level of event representation. Here like high level features, just uh, you know, high level features. Um, and then uh, you know, um, object oriented uh, um, uh, representation, particle level representation, local reconstruction where you have really uh, single hits and single modules that are in this uh, heterogeneous uh, pattern around uh, uh, across space and then the detector uh, data that is really the raw information uh, that uh, actually is not really tapped on and then we have applications of deep learning uh, starting from local reconstruction on. Um, now, so many, uh, many ways to look at the data. Of course, we don't only take data, we have to simulate what we uh, expect in the, in the detector. And, and this is, again, a computing intensive uh, sequence of, of uh, complex uh, programs, uh, starting from the invent generation, where we simulate the physics, then uh, some part uh, simulating the evolution of particles through, through space, then Gen4 and GNV are, are uh, the ones that uh, create the uh, emulation of what the particles will do through matter. And um, homegrown software for uh, transforming this interaction with matter uh, and local energy deposition into electronic signal that we will see from the detector. Now here again, something that is computing intensive, very complex part of, of uh, a set of, of uh, simulators. And actually, uh, you can uh, try to replace part or uh, uh, some of those with, uh, with deep learning application as we'll see forward. Um, but here, uh, the fact that it's computing intensive is actually 50-50 between uh, simulation and reconstruction, uh, or about. Um, and, and any work uh, to make this uh, less computing intensive is good uh, for the future of science. And this is the cost of, uh, of uh, doing science at the LHC now in, uh, in uh, the, the, the dots are the uh, expectation that the, of uh, the need for compute over the years, uh, and the black is below, and is actually the budget. So clearly, there's something that is wrong somewhere that uh, we have to get to get below the line for for being able to do uh, the design. So the future of computing is clearly GPU driven. Uh, even maybe the f further arch architectures will come through. Uh, quantum is far in the future, but maybe something is, is intermediate. But GPU, GPU are the ones for the, uh, the next, uh, the next uh, decade or so. So we have to make things work with GPU. And, and as you will see, machine learning is a good uh, uh, application for GPU because it's able to naturally use the uh, high level of parallelization that you can achieve with GPU. All right, what we do here, uh, measuring rare, uh, processes within a large amount of background. We have the standard model to make a large amount of prediction and then reconstruction, simulation, and, and the triggering or complex uh, computing intensive task <coughs> uh, with resource constraints. So uh, now that we know what uh, we're, we, we're uh, tackling, let's take a look at um, uh, you know, the machine learning landscape. Uh, not quickly, but uh, 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 not going into many of the details. If you're expecting equations, then, then you won't get it here. Yes. Sure. Yes. Sorry. Okay. So regarding this part where you have this um, this uh, flow with different types of oh, yeah, this one, the next one. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so the plan is to to uh, replace like to to find a ML deep learning solution for all, or only some of those uh, steps are available to be replaced with with ML. That's a good question. That's it. Um, depending on who you ask, the answer could be none or all. Um, now, to be realistic, um, it's not going to be end to end, and, and it, deep learning will not just uh, replace everything. Uh, what will most likely happen is that part of it will um, will be locally replaced. For example, in GNV, GN4, there is work going on for. Uh, 
um, um, shower um, shower simulation within Geon 4 uh, could be replaced and actually uh, are being replaced by experiments as we speak with deep learning uh, uh, with deep learning applications. In event generator, uh, where you have to uh, put the physics in, uh, the place where the deep learning can happen is uh, to do efficient sampling of any function. And, and uh, I might have a slide on this later on. Um, but because you have to learn, the f you have to, that's where you put the physics, probably deep learning is not going to replace all to all. Uh, and it's actually not a super computing intensive task. <coughs> um, the computing intensive tasks are really the, those two here. And then the atomization is already a phenomenological model of how uh, quarks cannot stay free uh, in space and just have to hadronize and then just get with as a bunch of hadrons. This is already a, a parameterized model, somehow very uh, nicely tuned to data. Uh, so here, there is a chance that, uh, that this will be uh, part or all replaced by, uh, by deep learning, uh, depending on who you ask or, or you know, how hard you work on this. Um, we're sort of getting there. Does that answer your question? All right. So uh, machine learning landscape. So again, um, we can't uh, really go into details of uh, uh, you know, uh, activations, whatever, and then uh, BDTs and whatnot. Um, so what uh, is really uh, key here is while you develop uh, and, and, and go through tutorials of machine learning um, or over more in-depth lecture, multi-hours lectures of uh, machine learning to keep uh, some of those aspects in mind while, while, uh, while, while going through this material. Um, but start uh, starting with uh, with uh, you know what what is machine learning in 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 uh, in, in a sense. Um, so th there is this quote that everybody does you know giving the ability uh, to computers to learn without explicitly programming them. Um, this is <coughs> sort of a definition. Now Glenn also asked the question whether fitting a straight line is machine learning, but it's essentially adjusting parameters to a certain uh, model. Um, now, when we go into machine learning and deep learning is when uh, actually it's not a straight line, but something with many, many parameters that has enough com uh, plasticity to look at uh, and, and uh, look at uh, very complex data and, and, and extract complex uh, information from it. Now, uh, yes, in practice, it's a statistical model with uh, enough plasticity that can extract information from the data, uh, something that would not be apparent otherwise. Now, most of the approach will actually come down to having a mathematical model uh, of, 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 uh, of the behavior, a cost-reward or loss function, uh, usually mono-objective, uh, mono and then it will all boil down to an optimization problem. And I want to add the note that uh, the domain knowledge is actually important. This is where the science, when you know the science and you should not completely drop science while doing machine learning for science, uh, but if you use the knowledge of physics, the knowledge of science, why developing application, it's going to always work better. And, and I have a couple of examples like this later on. I don't need this. But, um, so the, the, three, the three main parts of... of um, actually, I do need this. The three main parts of, uh, uh, for, 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 for machine learning uh, these days... Uh, Starting from actually the center, well, depending on how you like to, uh, to attack a cake, uh, you know, supervised learning is sort of the mostly uh, developed applications where uh, you uh, have a target, you have some data that is supposed to be highly correlated with the target, and you want to predict the target from, from, this, uh, from this data. Now, in supervised is when you don't really have a target or the target is part of the, of the data, the input data, and just want to learn the, uh, density, the density of, of the data or, or just the probability density function of the data. And then on the top, there is, uh, there is the reinforcement learning where actually um, you want to take control over some environment and the, there is, uh, the data is actually drawn from the environment. And I will just go quickly about those three. Starting from supervised learning again, here um, you have like a, you know, a data set with uh, some input and well, X and Y are the inputs, but YI is the thing that you'd like to predict from, uh, 
from the model that you're going to fit. So essentially, you're looking for a function f that will predict yi from xy, from xi. Um, and this is, uh, in most cases, in, in, in analysis, this is uh, used for classification, where essentially you have signal and background, and you want something that is able to, uh, to classify those so that you can remove efficiently uh, background and keep only the signal and, and, and or uh, noise and, and anything else um, in any other application. Now, regression is also another type uh, of, of uh, supervised learning where yi is here um, continuous variable, uh, an energy, a time, or something that is a continuous uh, feature. Um, this is also supervised learning, and you try to, the, to model uh, this, uh, the, the correlation between the two. All right, and supervised learning is when you put the yi in, or, or the label in the data, and you just want to learn what is the density uh, and the probability of, of any of the uh, elements of the data set. Uh, so this, this, this F now is really the, uh, the PDF of the data. Now, this is mostly used for clustering, dimensional, dimensionality reduction, or density estimator, and we'll see that this is what, um, what people use for a generative model or defining generative model because there is really not essentially a target uh, that you have, but really uh, a sample that you want to reproduce uh, uh, with a much faster, uh, in a much faster way. And then very quickly, because uh, this is extremely important in some cases, not really much developed within the high energy physics pipeline, but uh, <clears throat> in detector control, accelerator control, uh, computing uh, architecture control, this is, uh, it, it could be very useful. Uh, Reference learning is uh, uh, essentially you draw your labels. Uh, it, it's sort of supervised, uh, but you draw your labels and uh, the cost function is, is a reward that you extract from an environment that you interact with. Um, now, if the, if the environment is just really the real world, then this could be ex extremely expensive, and, and that's why people usually... Uh, it, it really works better when you have a simulator on the environment that you can work against or train your model against. Uh, you can, of course, do some... Uh, some uh, hybrid mode where you train a bit on data and then also on the simulator and whatnot. But here the name of the game is really to, uh, to, take, uh, to, to learn an action policy, to take action on the environment and then go uh, to, uh, to uh, an objective that you, uh, that you set yourself to for a best reward. And then that's why the, the, you know, the reward is essentially telling you whether your beam is well focused, whether your uh, if detector efficiency is the highest and things like this. Um, Something that a goal that you set uh, there, where it is not really a label in the data set, but uh, a cost function or a reward. All right. Now the landscape, um, and this is a, a picture taken from uh, Scikit-learn. Probably this is even uh, larger now. Um, you know, depending on what you have to do, then there is a bunch of uh, models here. Those are the the, the, the green boxes, uh, different. Uh, 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 type of, uh, of methods to do machine learning, going from uh, uh, um, between clustering, classification, and regression, you have uh, different features that are different uh, different methods that are up there. So just this to say that it's extremely wide. Um, there are multiple methods um, uh, for doing many things. How to choose is uh, state of the art. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's an art in itself. So uh, don't ask me what is the best uh, method to do uh, regression. There is no such answer anyway. In high energy physics, though, uh, for, for uh, a long time and doing classification and regression, people have used uh, decision trees. Uh, and they're a very simple model that are easily interpretable. Uh, I hate myself for saying this, but anyways, I'll say it. Um, where essentially you have, uh, uh, the features are set in a tree with the decisions in the internal nodes, and then you have uh, classes assigned to a leaves, and, and, there, and, and there this is a way to just classify the data, and you have just to percolate. When you have new elements, you just make it uh, go through the tree of decisions, and then you know what is uh, the classification that it belongs to, or the regression that it belongs to if uh, you make uh, the label being continuous variables. 
Now this was uh, this is used by legacy. Now most of the field is moving to to artificial neural network because of the uh, well not because it's less interpretable, but also because it has more plasticity and and it's been shown that it has more power uh, in, in getting uh, more accurate predictions. Now what artificial neural networks are is it's a biology inspired model for um, for functions. Now this is biologically inspired because it has well it's completely asynchronous. All the calculation is you know matrix uh, matrix wise and whatnot. Uh, while clearly the brain is not working at this, uh, we'll see that there are other architectures that are more uh, closely related to uh, to the uh, to how the brain works, but um, not so well defined uh, or developed. Sorry. Um, you've all heard about you know the uh, the uh, the success of deep learning at doing many various things in industry, uh, thanks to multiple things, actually, the increase of, uh, of uh, labeled data set in industry, uh, the computational power uh, coming with GP GPUs, and some theoretical novelties in, in deep learning uh, that uh, help uh, training some of those. So this, this type of model are there since uh, 50s, 60s uh, for a long time. Uh, but they, they, they really got a huge boost uh, thanks to those things. <coughs> so what we have in a sense um, is this uh, uh, neural network where you have uh, neurons, the circles here, um, and, and synapses uh, or, or connections in between. Input neurons, output neuron, uh, neurons, and uh, connection in between weights and... Uh, um, nonlinear activation functions uh, within this. Uh, we no need to go into into uh, into the details here, um, but essentially your data comes in at the beginning. Uh, you have a bunch of uh, matrix application, uh, matrix multiplications on the uh, the inputs, multiple internal layers, some non-linear uh, uh, mod uh, modifications of of, uh, of the weights internally of the activation internally, and then a, an, an output neuron that uh, you then uh, can um, put in a loss function. Here, this is the uh, classical cross-entropy for multi-category uh, classification. No really need to go into the details here, but this is telling you how well this output neurons is predicting the class that uh, <coughs> you want it to, uh, to, 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 you want the, the data to be, to be in. Now the beauty of this thing is uh, depending on, on uh, if you take a uh, differentiable activation function, then the whole thing is differentiable. And essentially you can uh, do the differentiation of the loss with respect to the uh, parameters of the model and essentially train those models and optimize those models with gradient descent. And this is seen. Uh, is, this is shown to be uh, extremely, uh, extremely powerful at uh, at fitting uh, uh, multivariate tests. Now there is the uh, um, uh, universal approximation theorem uh, that says that even with one layer, you can approximate any function with uh, with one such uh, with one such setup. Now it never it never says what is the depth or the width of, of this layer in between. Uh, that essentially, you need an infinite number of, of neurons but, um, to go with very complex function. But we have this, uh, this, uh, this uh, universal approximation theorem that uh, says that you can fit almost everything with this thing. Now, over the last uh, decade, uh, there's been uh, you know, going from a uh, simple feed-forward uh, network going with multiple uh, architectures. I won't go into the details of uh, some of those, um, but uh, there is essentially, because uh, this is extremely, you have a plasticity also in the way to arrange no, uh, neurons and, and connections. You can essentially build many things with many paths with redundancy uh, and multiple scales within, within the network, um, depending on how you think the data has to be looked at and how the information has to be processed through uh, the uh, through the network. Something related to artificial neural network, but uh, I will not talk too much about this. But I wanted to mention it during this lecture, <coughs> is um, spiking neural network that are 
way closer to how the brain works because it's essentially working as you know with spikes and there is essentially all the nodes are integrating these spikes over time and then when it's above a threshold then they would relapse to uh, to uh, to null potential but then hitting a hit uh, uh, hitting a spike um, on the uh, on, on the axiom uh, uh, downstream axiom so here this is um, this is a bit closer to what, how the brain works. Um, now, one of the issues early on with this kind of model is that uh, this was uh, to be trained with a genetic algorithm, for example, because most of it is non-differentiable. Now, there was um, recent work, and that's why I wanted to mention here that, uh, that uh, recent work on gradient-based method that allow people to train with gradient descent a spike in your network with uh, analogies between... Uh, between recurrent cells and, uh, and, and spiking networks. And again, here, uh, well, because of this evolution, there's a lot of uh, now Python libraries to train and implement uh, spiking neural networks. We'll come back to artificial net neural networks, but we're, we're done with spiking neural networks. And again, I wanted to mention QML, uh, quantum machine learning. This could be a full lecture in itself. Uh, I don't know actually whether there's a quantum computing lecture uh, this summer. Uh, maybe not yet, but uh, maybe next year. Um, worldwide, there is, a, there is a huge boost in, uh, in uh, quantum computing uh, from the software side because the hardware is also getting really fast ahead. One part of the quantum computing application is quantum machine learning where people realize that uh, you could have um, essentially, you know, it's, uh, it's the same where you have uh, an input state, an output state, and you can try to map one with the other where you map the output state with the target, train uh, whatever uh, parameters of the circuit inside here, uh, and then get something that uh, would, uh, would fit your data. Now, there is multiple methods here. just wanted to mention it. Two very powerful, uh, and actually there are more of those, but anyways, uh, a penny lane to TensorFlow Quantum that allows for doing uh, uh, almost uh, the same way you can do a train a, a TensorFlow model or Keras model with a, uh, with a GPU. You can actually here uh, implement a circuit and train a circuit really fast. Now, this is one, another branch of of, uh, of machine learning, trying to tap on the uh, the exponential advantage or theoretical uh, uh, exponential advantage of quantum computing. Just wanted to mention it. I can come back to this later on if you have questions. Circling back with the essence of machine learning, where essentially you have a data, a model um, uh, of any type, if they being uh, uh, decision trees, or artificial neural network, or spiking neural network, or a quantum circuit uh, with variable uh, parameters. You have an objective function that is uh, what uh, you want the, the, the circuit to achieve, uh, and then boils down to an optimization method, and then you uh, obtain a predictive model. So here, really, the central piece is optimization method, and uh, I don't think I don't have the slides for optimization because this would go way too long. But here, um, beyond gradient descent. Um, uh, there are all, all, all other ways uh, to do this, um, but if your model, the objective uh, are fully differentiable, then essentially you should use gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent when you uh, do a mini batch and whatnot. Um, but beyond this, there are other ways, Bayesian optimization, genetic algorithm, and, and other uh, maybe quantum-oriented uh, optimization. All right, but while um, developing uh, uh, such method, um, there are key aspects that you need to keep an eye on um, while, uh, while developing the, those methods. Because, well, essentially, if you look for any course, any tutorial machine learning, you'll find something that you can run within an hour. Um, and, uh, and then try to, to build on top. Now, you're going to probably hit many of the pitfalls or fall in, in many of those pitfalls uh, as you go on. Um, and I wanted to mention those. 
uh, so that uh, we're sure that uh, you, don't, you don't fall into this. The first one is when comparing two models for a given data set, same cost function and whatnot, same objective, um, you want to be able to compare them on a fair manner. And essentially, you want to make sure that the, uh, the metric and, and the performance of this model is, is, uh, is accurate and you have some sort of uncertainty assigned to it. And that's where cross-validation enters the game, where essentially you have a full training data set, which we will split in a uh, number of folds. Here there are 10 folds. And uh, keep uh, for, for you do 10 rounds of, of training the, the same model. Now, of course, you're going to get 10 different models and 10 different uh, accuracies or performance of the model. You train on, on nine parts and then keep one out for, for uh, estimating the accuracy. And then if you just get there 10 accuracies or 10 performance and then do it at the average, then you have also a better estimation of the performance of one model type for the, 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 the objective that you uh, set yourself to, uh, to work with. But you also have like an uncertainty or variance of this performance. And now when you go to compare uh, two models, then you have a better central point. And also you know that uh, if they're still within the uncertainty, then you know that this is just fluctuation. So k-folding or cross-validation is, is one key aspect uh, to have. If you do model comparison without cross-validation, you're doing it wrong. So not it down. Um, <clears throat> another part, uh, a key aspect um, that uh, you have to keep in mind while doing uh, developing a machine learning application is, is underfitting. So what this is, is when you have a, a model where essentially uh, I have to classify here the uh, crosses and the circles, and if I start with a model that has like uh, two parameters, it's a line, it could actually be just one. Um, now clearly, uh, this is not going to be uh, fitting properly the, uh, the data. And this is going to be seen by uh, 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 the performance on newly seen data uh, to, be, to be worse. Uh, and also uh, the boundaries or, the, or the, uh, the, the performance itself of the model not getting to a, to, a, to a high level. Now, of course, if you get into, if you, if you have a better functional to start the training in the first place, then you get to a better boundary between the two and the model is better. Now, the name of the game is, is to actually define this, uh, this, uh, this functional. Now, you could do it by hand. Uh, people are using artificial neural network because they have enough plasticity to fit this boundary by itself. Um, now, the other side of the, uh, uh, of, of the metal is that if you get with a model that has too much plasticity uh, and too many parameters, then you, cut, you, know, and you start to have like, the, the boundary go in between all the, uh, the elements uh, that you, that you uh, presented to the model. So clearly, a model that, is, that has done this <coughs> is going to be extremely performant on the training data set because it's going to be exactly predicting the labels for each of the uh, input data. Now, if you present any new data that would be uh, you know, uh, distributed uh, across this uh, natural uh, boundary, then it's going to be a worse performance, really, really worse performance. And that's, where, that's how you can um, monitor this. You can have many uh, parameters in your model, and then always verify that uh, your model, while, tr while looking at the trained data set, is able to generalize well to data that has not been trained on. And this is a uh, real way to, uh, to, uh, to keep this. So if you, you can train a model to death on a, on a data set, if you don't keep a validation set that is not used for training, where you can estimate the performance then you're doing it wrong. And if the performance between the validation set and the training set is very different, then that means the model has overfitted uh, the, data, the training set. All right, I'll go back to slide 31 uh, for another aspect. <coughs> when, again, comparing, uh, comparing models, uh, when comparing uh, different architectures, different model architectures, yes. Um, usually what you do, what one does, is that you have a fixed 
uh, data set, although you have a simulator to make more, but at, at a fixed time you have a fixed data set and you compare two models and you have one that is uh, you know, 5% more accurate than the other one and you just say, well, this architecture looks better than the other, than the other one, uh, but it only looks better. And it's better at this objective for this amount of data. Many of the time what you will see is, uh, by, by digging deeper, is that um, this is not saying that one architecture is worse for the task. It's really worse for the task at a given amount of training set, or training data. So what you can do um, is essentially look at what is the performance of your model with variable size of the training data set. And you will see that um, there is an evolution and, and an evolution of the model, of the model learning curve uh, that is uh, specific to the architecture. And this can have crossovers. Those are two uh, completely out of context. Uh, um, one is actually uh, a quantum uh, machine learning application and the other one are BDTs and, and uh, uh, decision trees and, and artificial neural network. But there is a learning curve with the number of, of, uh, of, of, of samples in the training, uh, in the training data set. So essentially, if you compare two models here, then you can tell, well, this one is better than the other one, but actually it is not. It's just a this fixed amount of uh, training set, of training, set, uh, training event, then that's the, 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 the performance is this way. But if you go in the asymptotic regime with infinite amount of data, sometimes you cannot, but sometimes you can have infinite amount of data, then you'll have uh, the, uh, the, the, ten, the, the, the trend that inverts. And, there you can say that um, when you're in the asymptotic regime, then you can say that one architecture is better than the other, than the other one. So something that almost nobody does in, in, any, uh, uh, in any application of machine learning is to show this plot. Now here, this is sort of uh, arbitrary because uh, we wanted to, to show that uh, the QML part was uh, sort of performing better at small training size. But usually, if you have a fixed data set, you can do 70%, 80%, 90%, 100%. And if you see something that you know, still grows with the number of data that you put in, then you can tell yourself, like, let's ask twice as much so that I can get even better performance. Now, this is uh, sort of clear and, and can actually uh, get you to have a better conclusion on, on, uh, on what you're looking at uh, doing uh, machine learning. All right. And sorry for jumping a bit back and forth. I realize that the ordering of the slides is not completely uh, natural, but uh, uh, because now we're going back to overfitting and underfitting. Um, anyways, um, one key aspect here, um, and, and when you're underfitting, essentially, uh, you have uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the performance on um, the training and validation set that are sort of equivalent, uh, but, and yet uh, the, 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 the one on the training set is, is a bit worse, uh, on the, the, the test set is a bit worse. And, and when you uh, reach this limit where the model is essentially over, starting to overfit, it learns even more from the training set but start to not generalize uh, on, the, on, the test, uh, on the test set. So the lower, the better here. This is the cost function of, 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 the, uh, of, the, of the model. Um, and the red is what you have on the validation or test set. And the blue is what you have on the training set. Um, so essentially here in blue, the model learns more and more and more about the, the, the data, but really does not generalize to any unseen data. So here, what you want to put yourself in is in this place here, where you have the best uh, trade-off between underfitting and overfitting. Um, sometimes uh, this overfitting will happen early on if you have no regularization, uh, and, and these are the things that you can actually combat to make this divergence between the red and the blue to happen the later, the la the later on so that you get the most out of, um, of the data. All right, um, so here's something. Um, Usually people train a model for 100 steps and take the best performance uh, over, the training, uh, of the, over the training set, and this is clearly wrong, right? You, because usually it's the last one, but the last one could be here, 
uh, and you have a model that just like completely uh, that suck at new data. So there, you really need to have uh, early stopping uh, a mechanism that really looks at the training or the, 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 the test set and stops when this starts to diverge. All right, so that's what you have to keep in mind. One key aspect uh, uh, of, of doing machine learning is this loss function or objective that you have that a, a differentiable objective for most uh, cases. Now, in, 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 um, in many of the applications, uh, if this is a classification, we have like uh, the, you know, the uh, cross entropy is the, the one that you really want to use. But in most cases, uh, you're looking at multi-objective and something that has a physics uh, objective down, down, downstream, uh, but is clearly not differentiable, like uh, tracking efficiency, uh, energy resolution, or these kind of things are, are non-differentiable objectives that you cannot just put in the model to optimize directly. So most of the time, the objective function will be just a, a proxy to this actual uh, figure of merit that's really looking at uh, in the end for the problem. Um, so it might be important to keep this in mind that this, this objective is really a proxy and that you want to keep an eye on this uh, downstream figure of merit as you train the model, as you optimize model, and so on and so forth. Now to be noted uh, also here is that um, doing model optimization um, you could be also, I mean, model optimization, artificial neural networks and deep learning are trained with gradient descent. Um, okay, fine, but then you can also look for the architectures, uh, different ways of building your, your neural network, and you do this with, uh, in a non-differentiable way with uh, Bayesian optimization, uh, uh, genetic algorithm, and whatnot. Those actually, this outer loop of optimization doesn't have to have a differentiable method because it's essentially, it's anyway a non-differentiable search in the first place. So this more physics-oriented figure of merit can be introduced at that point when you do architecture search. Something to keep in mind then, that those physics objective that are non-differentiable and cannot be put in the loss function of the model to train can be still used during the uh, architecture search and over optimization. All right, that was the, I'm not going to go into detail here. Um, one word on training and the computational aspect here, um, mostly to introduce uh, the concept of distributed training. Um, decision trees and other uh, very simplistic models are very fast to train, and usually on a laptop you can get those uh, to a good accuracy, uh, very, you know, with no problem. Now, if you go into deep learning, artificial neural network with uh, multiple layers, complicated architectures with over uh, differentiable functions in, 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 in the loop, then it can become uh, computational intensive. And that's where uh, GPU enters the game because uh, gradient descent, stochastic, stochastic gradient descent is extremely uh, parallelizable and essentially fits really well on, on GPU that is essentially a parallel, uh, parallelized uh, computation engine. <clears throat> but even though uh, you use a GPU uh, and, and there are some on the ground uh, to be used uh, for projects, um, you can still, with a single GPU, get into hours or days of training. So that's where uh, further parallelization can be obtained across multiple nodes and GPUs and then use tens, twenties of GPUs, uh, hundreds of nodes, or things like this, with distributed uh, training solutions. Um, and I just list uh, some of those, uh, one of the projects that is uh, CERN-based, but uh, uh, both TensorFlow and Torch will have uh, out-of-the-box uh, tool to do uh, distributed training um, to some extent. Uh, now, it can be, get uh, extremely involved, uh, and we're still looking for a, an all-integrated solution for doing this, but to keep in mind, that um, don't be too frustrated if it, uh, if it, if it gets into uh, computing intensive, taking hours to train. You can get this into a couple of minutes with, uh, with GPU and multi-GPU training. Um, I remember a uh, student who had uh, computation taking a 
couple of days and we boil down this uh, to a couple of hours thanks to distributed training. Um, and it, uh, it's really a booster for, for, for the project. So anyways, <coughs> a couple of words on hyperparameter optimization uh, that you will uh, hear about also and read about. Developing uh, machine learning uh, applications. So what we're talking about here are the parameters. So what is the difference between a parameter and a hyperparameter? Uh, well, they're just parameters, of course, but one you can optimize with gradient descent. Those would be the matrix elements in the artificial neural network uh, that uh, I talked about before, that you can, uh, you know, you can um, get a gradient or derivative of the loss versus with respect to this, uh, to the element of the, 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 the matrix or the weights. Uh, and those are the parameters, everything that you can optimize with gradient descent. Now those that you cannot optimize with gradient descent, for example, the number of layers in your model or the number of nodes, those are things that really uh, need to be optimized in an other way. Uh, and, and that's what we call hyperparameter optimization. Now, usually uh, there is uh, actually uh, more than four. And there is, uh, the first one is the grad student descent, where essentially uh, you know, the student uh, tries one and then tries another one and then tries another one and then lose weeks and, and days doing this. And then, uh, of course, it could be exciting because then uh, you think you're doing something, uh, you're just uh, uh, browsing the, uh, the landscape of uh, multiple models and multiple model architecture. But essentially, this is really not a, a, a good use of a, a student time. So uh, the other brute force is simple grid search, where you have uh, you know, two, three parameters. You just uh, map those into a grid, and then you try everything. Now, this could be computing intensive, of course. If you go to multiple uh, tens of parameters, uh, hyperparameters to tune, then you can't really do a grid search. And that's where uh, evolutionary algorithm Bayesian optimization entered the game for doing hyperparameter optimization. So really here, if you have a problem, a, you know, supervised training, or actually in supervised a model architecture, or a family of model architecture, we say, uh, I'm going to use a, a, a feed-forward model with uh, n layers and m neurons per, per layer. Um, how to fix the n and the m? Never go by hand. Uh, just really directly go with uh, skopt, hyperopt, that are implementing Bayesian optimization over those two parameters. If you do otherwise, you're just going to waste time. Uh, and, and, and this will be just doing it for, 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 for you. And there is multiple, uh, multiple uh, tutorials here uh, to do this. So please, please, please don't, don't do architecture search by, by, by hand. Um, now, reminder, um, when you do this architecture search, because uh, some of those need to compare models and, and have a best, uh, you know, a, a, a accurate estimation of the performance of the model. You have to have actually the k-folding. So k-folding plus uh, Bayesian optimization with uh, with uh, with early stopping, uh, monitoring of the uh, generalization along the way, and then you have this loop set up, and you can uh, just push the button, uh, go climb. Uh, come back and uh, see that uh, it's converged on the best model and, and said that you've done it by hand, although you uh, let the, the, the machines do it for you. Yes. Um, so I have a question regarding this, uh, this hyperparameter optimization. So like, um, because when you do the, this optimization and when you do k-folding, you must perform a lot of, a lot of number of, of trainings. So do you train in this situation the model fully or you reduce the number of epochs and you cut the model uh, area. I, and I'm not saying about early stopping, but I'm saying uh, that if you want to train, uh, if you want to find this, this trade-off, bias trade-off between the uh, variance and, and, and bias, it will take ages if you want to also do the case, case folding and looking for different models. So how to, to, how to optimize the number of epochs? And, uh, I don't know. Um, that's a very good question. Now the first one is patience. Right. In there, if, you, if you're too fast and, and, and uh, have like a student right now that is trying to cut corners, it, this is not going to work. You don't cut corners with training. If it takes long, it takes long. That's, that's, that's it. Now, what you can be, uh, you, can be uh, you can be smart about it. Um, now, in this picture here, 
you really want to hit this spot. Uh, and, and there is no really other way than just saying, I'm just going to monitor the testing uh, performance. And as soon as it's div the diverging, I'll just stop and maybe take the best one at the bottom of the red curve. Um, now, if this, uh, if it takes 10 hours to get to this bottom, well, it gets, you know, it's 10 hours. Now, the good thing is that um, when you do hyperparameter optimization, well, no, you've, you said k-folding first. Um, where is k-folding? It's here. Um, those 10 trainings are completely independent. So if you have 10 GPUs, 10 machines, it's 10 hours, 10 hours. Then 10, you could like do 100. If you have 100 machines, then it's 10 hours. So this is fully parallel. You can really train all of those parallel, in, in parallel. That's one of, so if it takes n, doing 10 it will take n if you have, well, whatever. If you have n machine, you can it's, it's take the same. Um, and furthermore, um, there is the other level of, 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 um, of parallelization. So here you have to first buy the bullet to get to the, to the bottom of the red curve. That, that, that's, that's it. Right? Because that's where you want to be. So you don't cut corners. You have to you go where you want to be. Now, you, it doesn't have to take uh, forever. If you just uh, optimize things by hand, then you get into one, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one. And so it's fully serialized. If you do a simple grid search, uh, you can do all the points of the grids at, uh, you know, at the same time. So here, fully parallelized. Evolutionary algorithm has also all the, uh, all the individuals within a uh, certain um, generation have to be estimated in parallel. So if you have uh, enough, par uh, enough machines or enough cores, you can launch multiple processes on the site. So it's also, to a large extent, uh, uh, parallel. Now, one of the issues of Bayesian optimization is really uh, that you want it to be sequential. Although you have like a 10 initial point randomly in the space of, uh, of models that you can do in parallel, the one after you sort of want them to just come one after the other because the next model is predicted with information to have acquired on the previous one. But even there, you can uh, achieve uh, some level of, of, uh, of, uh, of parallelism by trying out multiple uh, models in parallel. Um, but you can't go really further than this, yes. Um, I think uh, there's also, uh, like, for example, the Optuna algorithm, which I, I know about, which also does some crosstalk between uh, different trials um, <laughs> and cuts away uh, trials that are less promising. But also one, one question that I had is, uh, can you, for example, estimate the model structure if you, for example, have a regression problem uh, by simply taking only a smaller subset of your data and then optimizing for that and maybe estimating uh, a location of a minimum and then train on the full data set such that you would uh, essentially save time for each training. Right, you could do this. Um, there, 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 is, uh, there, is multi there are multiple recipes. Now, indeed, uh, the, list, the, list of, uh, uh, the list here is uh, sort of um, truncated. Actually, experiment is really old. Uh, that's one of the very early implementation of Bayesian optimization that we used. Um, as for training or cutting corners, you can, uh, as long as there is uh, no walls. Uh, where is the, where is the, as long as there is no walls around the corner, right? Um, sorry, where was I? I was here, yes. If you uh, start, you know, train on 100 and say, well, you know, uh, but then uh, you could just be uh, fooling yourself uh, in doing the optimization. Now, if you know that you're in the asymptotic mode, then yes, you could try to train on, on less data. So that means that you could do this. You train on, uh, you set yourself with like 10% of the data, train on this, train on 15. If those two are comparable, you can say, okay, well, fine, this is the performance of this architecture because I know that I'm in the plateau. And then train on, on something later on. Now, the, the whole point is there. You have to make sure that you're on the plateau here. And then you can cut corners. Yes. Um, one more question about this hyperparameter optimization. 
how to choose the parameters which should be optimized because probably not all of them are equally relevant. So I don't know, like right now everyone uses Adam, uh, Adam as, a, as an optimizer, so probably there is no point to check like, I don't know, 10 opt optimizers. But learning rate might be much more important. So like if I create like, I don't know, 60 of hyperparameters and uh, this one of those libraries would have to check all of them, it will really take ages. But some of them like might be somehow obviously cut, but which? <laughs> Um, so yes, the uh, optimizer doesn't have to be uh, picked at random, although depending on what paper you read, uh, sometimes it's Adam, sometimes it's Adagrad, uh, there's still a bit, uh, you know, the jury is still a bit out on this. Um, um, <sighs> that's a very good question. Um, in general, when you have... Uh, when you have a um, model uh, type or family of models, uh, there are not infinite number of directions you can go. Um, uh, they could, well, depending on how crazy you are, of course. Um, um, you, can, you can optimize the dropout, uh, for example, that is a regularization method. You can optimize the learning rate number of uh, number of nodes a number of layers um, and other things now what parameter would make a difference really it always um, the first two is really the depth of the model and the width of the model because that's where you have more capacity now, of course it's increased the number of, uh, of parameters but that's where you can hope that the model has more capacity to fit better the data. Uh, learning rate is another one that actually I'm super unhappy with learning rates. I don't see why we don't have a forget about learning rate and just let it tra train without without having to fix the learning rate and play with it. Uh, it's really annoying. Um, but that's one of the one of the parameters that people usually uh, optimize because it can affect a lot the training performance, especially when you have an early stopping mechanism because it's, uh, it usually drives the choppiness of the loss function as uh, you go and you train. The rest of the parameters, it's really um, when, uh, when, you, when you pick up a, 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 a family of models, you, you know what are the dimensions that you can, that you can go along. Now, if you're going to do grid search, this is going to take ages. If you do Bayesian optimization, it's going to take 10% of ages, which is still ages uh, when, uh, you know, infinite multiplication, but still. Okay. Um, so by now, there is, uh, you've, uh, you've noted uh, multiple things that to keep, to keep an eye on and, and to really keep in mind while, while developing your application. Um, the next part is actually, I have my model, it's trained, I have to take ages to, to, to optimize it, and it's all nice with bells and whistles. Um, now I try to put it uh, and then try to make prediction, and, and uh, my supervisor takes me, it tells me that, uh, well, it's taking too long to execute. Um, and, and well, then, then you're sort of stuck. But um, it's never going to be the case, because the supervisor will be always excited. Um, but the cost of running the model is uh, is a key aspect, especially if you recall that we have triggering uh, at the LHC that you have to go from 40 megahertz to a couple of kilohertz, and this has to happen within milliseconds, if not nanoseconds, or tens of nanoseconds. Um, so if you're looking for trigger applications, you clearly want to have something that is extremely fast, and then people have looked at ways to do this and transform uh, models into FPGAs, uh, those are field, prog field programmable gate array uh, that are uh, extremely fast uh, computers. That's how, uh, that's what compose uh, most of the uh, hardware of the triggers of the experiment. And of course, uh, GPU, TPUs are things that can get you also acceleration during the inference. That is what, uh, you know, a, a barbaric word for just running prediction for the model. Um, and there is also uh, the point of inference as a service. Now, if you have an application that is within CPU and has no ac access to an accelerator, being an FPGA, TPU, or GPU, 
uh, you can still get access to a remote accelerator with uh, this, you know, by just sending the model and the data to uh, to this remote accelerator, and it will give you uh, the uh, the answer back. Now, this works as long as the communicating back and forth is uh, smaller than the time you gain by running it on the accelerator. Otherwise, you just lose. Anyway, so things that to keep in mind that the, the, the time to run the, the model is, is key, and, and some of the times the choice of architecture has to be driven by the time it takes to, uh, to execute. If you have a very complex graph model, <coughs> uh, graph neural network with also some uh, differentiable uh, applications within it and functions that uh, goes across the graph, this is going to be extremely uh, uh, expensive to run. And maybe if you're like a time-constrained application, you might want to prefer transformers applications that are transformer models that are more more streamlined somehow. Uh, so keep in mind the cost of, of running the model. Sometimes it's not really important, but in many cases it, it will. Um, all right. So by now you have. Uh, uh, many of the red flags that would raise uh, be raised uh, if you uh, if you didn't know about uh, about those items. Um, now, machine learning is just uh, you know this is uh, sort of a, also a, a very experimental field. Uh, people will hate me for saying this, but anyways, um, with some theoretical background, but it's really experimental to a large uh, level. So we have to approach this with a scientific rigor. And I listed many of the points that you really have to keep in mind uh, while developing applications uh, in high energy physics. Um, there are many interesting studies, actually, uh, possible uh, that don't relate to collider or high energy physics, but really on the data science point of view on machine learning, but have with an eye, uh, you know, scientific eye on it, um, things that can be answered or, or actually uh, studied. Um, and then, last but not least, you know, keeping the eye on making predictions uh, with the model that you train. All right. Um, I think we hit the hour, which is good. We didn't work. Okay. <coughs> so for the um, now, um, the second part is um, of this lecture is. Um, is uh, first, why do we want to use machine learning in, in, in uh, at Collider? And, um, and also, what are the applications that people have developed that you can actually base your work on and extend uh, further on? And also, what are the key aspects of data science that, that relate to, uh, to, uh, to doing machine learning at, uh, at high energy physics, at Collider, sorry. <coughs> So a couple of words on motivation. I think I started with the right one, talking to students. Usually it doesn't really land super well with, uh, with PIs. But uh, um, doing uh, machine learning as part of a particle physics or collider uh, courses is really good because uh, you know, uh, machine learning is booming in industry with uh, multiple uh, multiple companies, including AI in their workflows, uh, the use of uh, deep learning everywhere. Uh, we've seen this um, across the board. Um, not all of us can stay in, in particle physics or uh, within, uh, within the uh, collider reach. And sometimes you have to go uh, further in industry, which is good, uh, because we carry on the scientific rigor into, into other fields. Doing uh, ML in IG physics is a good, uh, good baggage to give uh, to give to students. <clears throat> One of the things that has been uh, shown with with ML and AI these days is that you can uh, take control over things uh, with AI, self-driving, self-playing, and whatnot. Um, and this is uh, that's one thing that you could you could really want to take advantage of in a field where you need as much automation as possible so that you spend your time not in pushing buttons, but really doing the physics, understanding what's going on, and doing things like this. So uh, if you could use AI to take control over things, over apparatus, this is a good thing. <clears throat> um, 
another motivation looking back at the um, this curve of the flat budget or the, yeah, the, the budget that is below the expectation of the need for resources for doing uh, uh, LHC uh, physics. Um, and this, this curve is actually, or the, the, the points are not really including a lot of uh, machine learning uh, applications. Now, ML and, and especially artificial neural network are mostly matrix multiplications and things that are extremely parallelizable or vectorizable to a large extent. And that fits this next generation of, um, of computing architecture, GP, GPUs, and whatnot, uh, and also tensor product unit or tensor processing unit <coughs> that are really getting at the core of doing the computation of, of neural networks uh, in the hardware. Um, so there is a way of doing, doing this, this really fast. Um, Jumping one second back to uh, spiking neural network, I said I would not come back to it, but I would do. Um, one of the uh, one of the issue these days and and in the years to come and the generations to come is the uh, use of power. Uh, actually, electricity crisis is uh, rising uh, here. Um, now, one thing with uh, spiking neural network is that they are very low power uh, uh, engines. And here uh, you have these uh, <coughs> big, uh, big models, very con uh, uh, conventional deep learning models with uh, uh, convolutional layers, uh, very deep with many parameters. And a spiking neural network that is actually able to do exactly the same, but with only a couple of neurons, a uh, handful of synapses, connections between the two and then really able to run at the microjoule level, while if you run this on a, on a GPU, then, then you'll be way higher than this. So um, something when, when you're in the energy efficient uh, computing, FPGAs and spiking neural networks are sort of uh, uh, very low power consumption. And that could be key. Another motivation that has been um, uh, is interpretability. Um, now, as I said earlier, BDTs were used uh, as a legacy tool in high energy physics because people could look at the tree and say, well, it's doing this, so we can understand what the model is doing. With artificial neural network, it's a bit more difficult because there are weights and then internal activations and whatnot, so it's not completely visible what's, what's happening. So people sort of push back a bit on artificial network because of the lack of interpretability. So people have worked on this. Be, you know, at the interface of high energy physics and data science to try to learn or gain understanding from, um, from the model. And here, uh, this is a place where actually uh, a couple of papers and, and there's a lot of uh, other work in this direction where you train a deep, mo deep learning model and then you extract observable uh, or families of observable from it. Uh, and here, um, this is essentially what, uh, what uh, this uh, uh, graph representation of operators uh, over uh, particle-based uh, um, representation of the events uh, is, is doing. Um, and you can essentially uh, know what, what the model has learned and what are the functions that map to the decision process of the model. So here you can really help understand what are the new observables that you could use in a very classical analysis to do, uh, to do, uh, to do physics. Now, yeah, there is a bit of limitation to this, but uh, <clears throat> the other direction that really works really, really well is uh, when you don't forget that you learn physics at school and science and, and do machine learning without uh, you know, forgetting about everything else. Um, but when you do uh, ML and remembering your, all your physics course, now this is a one, one, one extremely good example um, where essentially here we have a, the, the, the name of the game is to predict the trajectories of particles uh, within some, uh, some environment. Um, and there's multiple models here that are developed graph network where the, uh, the interaction between the particles is considered and, and uh, learned uh, throughout the process. And the model that performs the best is here uh, with uh, I never remember what the uh, H O G N means. The G is for graph and N for network, um, and H for Hamiltonian, where you essentially remember that uh, you've learned uh, physics and, and that you know that uh, uh, 
<coughs> the evolution of particle and, and the kinematic is driven by Hamiltonian. And if instead of learning just uh, barbaric uh, interaction between the two particles, you learn what's happening, uh, learn the Hamiltonian function, then you get a model that is way better than anything else you can have. Um, so here, a clear example of inductive bias where you put, uh, you in embed the physics principles in the model. This is not always trivial and, and easier said than done, uh, but uh, clearly something to keep in mind. If you, if you know you can tell the model something instead of having it fully connected, completely blind, then, then it, it, it's always going to work better and help you uh, getting uh, forward a bit. Um, now there is... So if I may, so um, when you optimize this, uh, when you do this approach with Hamiltonian, then this Hamiltonian is somehow integrated with loss function, but you still work on those data only on, uh, on the very first uh, left or on the par particles, or you try to like, model the Hamiltonian itself and you use like normal loss function, like, I don't know. Uh, cross entropy, whatever. Um, so here, uh, the, the 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 prediction uh, of the loss is um, is based on the. Um, let me remember this. I, do, um, I think it's it's a step. It's a step. Uh, it's di discretized in time, and from one step, from one position, you try to predict the next position, and 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 that's where, that's what you can do with. Uh, stepping the Hamiltonian here. Um, in this part, you have to read the paper. Okay. Um, Is this one? Uh, yes, that's the one there. Um, there might be, there's, since that one, there's been like a humongous amount of Hamilton-based uh, uh, models uh, to also in relation to quantum computing. Uh, but anyways, uh, um, yeah, I, can't, I, can't answer, I cannot answer at this point, sorry. Um, another important aspect for developing or, or to develop, uh, to motivate developing or using uh, machine learning in ideal physics is when you see this kind of, uh, of model here that is uh, an image-based uh, 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 classification where you have like a thousand classes here that you just want to... Uh, uh, categorize based on, 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 on the image. Um, and this model essentially uh, is able to learn internal representation and, and to really learn this task purely from the data um, without actually inductive bias some, to some extent. But <clears throat> so you have something that is able to extract complex information complex from a complex data set without really anything to be, to be fed in. Now, in some uh, in, in some cases, um, uh, this 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 supplant uh, years and years of development of classical algorithm, uh, and actually that, that's what happened in image recognition, where image recognition has been on forever with very classical methods, and then when deep learning came in, it just like got way better uh, without any of the inductive uh, bias that uh, were used before. So there's going to be a trade-off somehow to actually put back the knowledge in it, but deep learning is able to extract data, uh, extract information from complex data set without being told uh, otherwise. Um, so that's something that's really useful for science where we have a lot of data, a lot of simulation, and, and you can just learn from this instead of, uh, of, of uh, taking years of developing other algorithms. And just quickly back to this, uh, this uh, AI pipeline, or the, uh, the app pipeline, which is now the AI in app pipeline. Um, you know, you can put machine learning, of course, in the end, the analysis doing a classification. Uh, you can use AI to uh, distribute better the data. You can uh, have sur surrogate model for the simulation, uh, uh, data location. Uh, also, well, yeah, I said that already. Um, the, um, maybe data compression uh, could, be, could be also done with, uh, with AI. All the reconstruction, simulation, triggering, detector control, accelerator control, AI can fit everywhere or will and will fit everywhere, essentially. Uh, we see applications everywhere, uh, uh, happening at all levels. <clears throat> all right. Um, 
Now, ML is, is uh, extremely useful in industry, so that's a good package to keep uh, to have on your CV. Um, if, uh, because, well, that's good for students. Um, it has uh, potential and also shown uh, 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 great pro, uh, pro, uh, prospects for, 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 for science. Um, at some level, it could help with the computing requirement. Uh, now, most of the time, the, 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 the models will be more expensive than the classical algorithms, but that's just because we're using it only at the analysis level with uh, very uh, simplistic uh, ways of doing things. Now, if you bring it down, for example, at the simulation level with generative models, which we'll go into uh, in, in, a, in a minute, then you see that you can actually get a huge boost in, in uh, computing performance. All right. Now, I'm going to sort of uh, go down the, or go up or down, depends on how you see it, uh, whether you're an accelerator or an analysis person. Um, uh, down the chain uh, of, of, uh, of uh, how the data goes through the pipeline and then, and then uh, highlight some of the key aspects and how we can use AI at all those levels. And also try to point out um, some of the references that could be sort of outdated, and I'm sorry for this, um, but um, there is always the living review that will have a very up-to-date um, up uh, documentation. All right, we can start with producing the data and actually controlling the accelerators and the detectors and whatnot. Um, there is uh, multiple early work on, uh, sort of there is all two years old because of the COVID, but anyways, um, there is a lot of development there in, in tuning the detector, tuning the accelerator, controlling the accelerator, getting way ahead uh, for, the, for, the, for the money. You know that accelerator time is extremely expensive. So if you can tune it faster, get it to work faster in, in, the, in a shorter amount of time, then it's, it's, uh, it's always better. Now, there's a lot of promising R&D, and, and this is getting there. I think it's, it's getting more and more in production. Uh, we see uh, uh, less and less resistance to this, and then, and then this is really getting somewhere. You produce the data, now you have to acquire it. And as I was uh, saying earlier, um, <coughs> beyond the... Uh, X era where we knew what to look for. Uh, you have these uh, multiple uh, extension to the standard model possible or exotic processes that, and we don't know exactly what uh, what to look for. So here you could actually try to look for the unknown, and and this is where uh, anomaly detection and uh, yes, anomaly detection uh, is is uh, is really uh, taking off. Um, and here the name of the game is to learn what you expect from the standard model with machine learning and anything that diverge from it, uh, the model will be able to, to, uh, to single it out and then you can just trigger those, put it on disk and then, and then, and then analyze this afterwards. Um, and there's not gonna be any ends on, this was from the past uh, presentation. The data is huge, you can of course compress it with, uh, with uh, this uh, autoencoder models. Uh, maybe we can come back to this. <coughs> but essentially, um, the same way um, image compression works, uh, to some extent, you can go from the pure pixel-based compression to a semantic compression where, um, where really, uh, if you have a picture of a cat on the window, then the, compre the best compression is a cat on the window. And then that's, that's, uh, that's what you can get here also. Um, uh, and, and that's what people are trying to do with, uh, with, uh, with uh, detector data uh, uh, to, get, uh, to get to a very condensed uh, data format that would save a huge amount of disk and tape uh, that has an extremely large cost uh, for, for, for doing, uh, do, doing science and actually uh, as you've seen, that the budget in, uh, that was in this initial curve is really millions and millions of dollars. Uh, and uh, if, if we can uh, reduce any of the cost at the, at the, at the beginning, then, then that's, uh, that's, that's a good thing. <coughs> um, now, despite uh, having uh, a lot of care taken to, uh, to, uh, to have a detector behaving well, all the electronics behaving well, then there is always a glitch and, bl and, and, and blips here and there. 
um, and you have to, to, clean, to clean the data and, and monitor what is going on in the detector to take out the things that are uh, really not good for analysis. For example, here, this is for CMS, one of the experiments. You have a, a chunk or slice of the detector that is uh, giving uh, some signals here, probably energy deposition or something like this, although this, yeah, um, <clears throat> or counts in, in, in some of the muon chambers. What you expect is something that is super flat and super nice and, and clean. Now, if you start to see things like this in the occupancy, you can clearly see that there is something wrong. Now, if this is happening in the control room downstairs, and unfortunately the shifter is uh, sleeping at the time, then, well, this is going to go on, and then nothing is going to happen. Uh, or if it gets detracted for a second, or this is happening very rarely, or like is not seen by the regular uh, quality pipeline, then, then you, you can't really see this, um, and, and, and trigger on it, and then get an alarm, and then act on, on, the, on the detector. So the name of the game with, all, again, this autoencoder, system where uh, you essentially learn what you expect uh, and anything that deviates from it is just an anomaly and, and, and you can see it and identify it and react to it. Um, so the same way you can trigger on anomalous uh, physics, you can trigger on anomalous uh, signal in, in the detector. Now sometimes they're indistinguishable but uh, uh, that's good for, for cleaning and, and post-processing of the data. Um, <coughs> place where you can use AI is in, in managing the data uh, and multiple uh, efforts is, are ongoing with uh, um, operational intelligence um, where you can try to monitor the computing uh, system uh, or actually this one that I really like uh, very much where you have a cache, uh, data caching uh, strategies using reinforcement learning. Actually that was the purpose here but uh, now they, they, they move forward with, uh, with re reinforcement learning so that when you try to analyze the data, it's uh, on the right cache very close to you so that uh, you get access to it uh, fast. And then um, you have a, best, uh, a better usage of, uh, of uh, the computing infrastructure. Now you've distributed the data and people start to reconstruct what was uh, uh, happening in the detector. Um, remember the, uh, the multiple uh, level of uh, data representation and for each going from one representation to the other there is a sequence of uh, computing intensive uh, algorithms uh, mostly and, and, and tailored and things like this. Um, for most of these, uh, this uh, reconstruction it is pattern recognition at large um, uh, being clustering, uh, regression, classification or things like this. Um, and at many of the level, many of the algorithms that uh, that were developed over years and decades of doing uh, particle physics uh, and doing the reconstruction of, of the particle physics detector, uh, some of those and many of those can be tackled with uh, with deep learning. And, and and again, if you go to this uh, to the uh, living view, you'll find an enormous amount of those. I want to single out maybe tracking where the name of the game is essentially have like uh, the detector in, is in black here and just record dots along the way and then the name of the game is to connect the dots uh, for the particle that was emanated uh, starting from the center here and just coming out and leaving dots along the way. You have to connect the dots and this is um, uh, taking a major fraction of the reconstruction of the data uh, in experiments. So that's why people start to look at ways of doing the uh, machine learning here uh, to, to tackle those. Um, I'll come back to this maybe later on. Would I? Yes. Maybe not. Anyways. Um, reconstructing the data, of course, then you get an histogram of the data that uh, you get from the detector. Now you're happy, but you need to know what you were expecting. So that's where the simulation you know, kicks in. It's a computing intensive task again, uh, and then replacing part or uh, bits and pieces of the simulation with, uh, with generative models uh, could get you faster because uh, replacing a computing intensive uh, algorithms with something that really just needs uh, or generates samples from noise in, in a couple of matrix uh, multiplications, especially because then you can use the full parallelism and generate multiple events at the same time with GPUs. Uh, people have demonstrated, you know, you know, 
thousand x speed up over classical. Uh, you know, thousand is actually lower bound. It could be even higher for parts uh, of uh, of uh, the, the simulation. And um, essentially, here uh, an, an, an example where you uh, try to reproduce the um, the signal that you will see in the uh, in one of the detector of the LHCb applic uh, the um, experiment. Um, I think the plain histogram is is one, and the solid is the other one. Um, and well, it doesn't matter because they match really well. Uh, meaning that the, the generative model that was trained on the full, very expensive simulation is actually now able to just reproduce the data. Now this is based on a couple of features. Here nine, you want to get this uh, uh, to a high level. Uh, Atlas has actually recently put one such uh, deep learning model uh, inside of their uh, simulation chain um, in the calorimeter simulation that is extremely expensive in the Atlas. <clears throat> Another part um, uh, that is a bit closer to reconstruction is calibrating the data, uh, something that by legacy has been also uh, really used and, and at the forefront of using ML in high energy physics is calibrating the data where you get uh, some signal out of the detector, but you really don't know uh, uh, what energy it corresponds to. And by comparing uh, data with simulation and whatnot, you can, uh, you can, uh, you can do this calibration. And here, essentially regression, uh, but not only, can be done with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with deep learning and other machine learning method. Um, but also ways of doing scale factors and whatnot uh, doing analysis uh, can be done with, uh, with ML. One key aspect uh, doing analysis, now that you have uh, the, the histogram from, uh, or, or like some, uh, some signal sample from, well, from some sample from the, from the detector with the simulation that is, um, uh, that is, uh, that is uh, mimicking it, um, you want to separate signal and background, and uh, here um, there are new ways of doing uh, signal and background rejections, also in, a, in, a, in an unsupervised way here by uh, also taking um, the, 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 the signal really as anomalous uh, signal and then getting it uh, singled out. So um, again here are multiple methods to doing, uh, to do uh, and to develop uh, um, classification of signal and background. Very quickly, because that's uh, actually uh, very dense, and, and uh, <coughs> this could be a lecture, and it should be a lecture in itself, um, about um, uh, likelihood three inference. Uh, and there's multiple things here. So you have uh, the, the, uh, the um, the diagram here is that you have the whole uh, pipeline where you have a generator uh, with a couple of parameters from uh, you know the, the new physics model that you have, and it goes down to having um, to simulate some data, and then you want to extract what is the best parameters of the initial generator that fits the data that you have. Um, but because the whole pipeline is non-differentiable, you just cannot do a gradient descent on this. But you have to do this likelihood free inference um, and, and essentially uh, introduce uh, ML to do this, uh, this parameter estimation. So um, <clears throat> um, lots of uh, interesting, uh, interesting work in this, uh, in this direction of, of likelihood free inference. <coughs> but overall, um, We've seen a rapid growth of, of, uh, of uh, deep learning applications for HEP, and actually some of those are getting into, into production. Not many are actually getting into production. Many uh, are staying at the proof of concept level, um, and hopefully uh, some younger minds will, uh, will tackle the doing things for experiment, uh, uh, which is uh, essentially the hard work of, of getting uh, the proof of concept to reality. Um, and although this slide is actually a couple of years old, I think there's still an exciting time in exploiting AI for, for energy physics. Um, and I have just a quick slide just for the reference. I, I don't think uh, we, uh, we have to go into any of this uh, at this time. Uh, but there is 
also growing literature on uh, QML for HEP, uh, if you're interested, um, and that your supervisor will not hate me for putting this slide out. Um, maybe coming back to uh, some of the, um, unless there are other questions or questions maybe at this point. No? You don't have a question? Um, maybe repeating some of the um, some of the specifics of developing ML for, uh, for for at Collider and for energy physics, really nailing down what are the things that uh, really are, are on the interface of uh, data science and particle physics, um, and essentially where. Um, where we can compete here, because uh, if it's fully data science, then, well, there is deep mind and whatnot to do this. Uh, we're in the interface, and uh, that's where we can use the physics to do better ML, and ML to do better physics. All right, so now the key aspect. Um, quickly also, because uh, as, as I uh, uh, mentioned um, early on, there are multiple level of data representation. And when you go through the literature of how things have uh, developed um, uh, for ML in, in HEP, um, you'll see that, well, this is there. It started with image representation uh, because uh, depending on what detector you look at, um, you have this uh, representation that is not a complete image because there you just looked at, you know, the beam is uh, like uh, perpendicular to the, uh, to the screen. <coughs> and the energy and all the particles go like outwards of the collision point. Now, if you take, um, if you take this, uh, this kilometer, for example, and you just unroll it, then this is, uh, you get a, a, a rectangular image of what the energy deposition was. Of course, this is a cyclic representation because uh, the borders were touching. But anyways, that's why people started to look at image representation and essentially looking at how the particle project onto the calorimeter layer uh, uh, surface, of course, with some uh, some uh, um, taking into account some of the symmetries and uh, rotational invariance of of the data uh, to make sure that things are aligned because a jet could be uh, is a jet could be uh, is the same and could rotate and has the same uh, put, um, the same properties even if it's rotated. So just aligning uh, those images. And then that's where some of the early work, as you can see, uh, you know, even early uh, 2015, uh, we're using images um, and uh, for, for various types of, uh, of jet uh, tagging. Uh, that is uh, one key aspect of doing analysis uh, at the uh, Hadden Collider. Now, the problem here is that you started with uh, really, truly particles going through the detector, and at some point they leave a single cell or a single image representation of uh, the energy that they were carrying on, and you don't have any other information. So by doing this pixel or this image representation, you, there is a potential loss of information unless you have very fine-grained image and you're able to pick out other things, um, which some people have demonstrated that, that sort of works. but then it becomes a very expensive model in terms of image representation. So you can go with, uh, with, with um, um, another representation that was sort of intermediate with um, uh, using the particles that you get into the detector with particle-based representation. You can think those as, as a words of a sequence that is telling you the story of what happened during the collision. And that's essentially what was happening here with two examples, and there's multiple others of uh, doing, uh, again, bidget tagging, so this spray of particle de de uh, uh, deciding whether the, this bidget was coming from, uh, from a light quark or heavy quark or whatnot. Um, now, the, word, the, the problem here is that there is no ordering, no natural ordering of the particles in the uh, detector. They just all come out as a spray. Now, and then you have to put a, a physics-inspired ordering, being uh, momentum-wise, energy-wise, uh, or uh, backward-forward-wise. Um, that was a bit of, word, uh, of work on, on uh, using more uh, uh, um, 
physics inspired physics inspired ordering of of um, of those particles uh, to do uh, classification and whatnot. But anyway, there is this problem of ordering words in in, in the sequence uh, because uh, uh, in this case, what you get from the detector is is all the words of a book at once, and then you have to make the story yourself. Um, so that's not really the same as getting the book and just reading it and then doing an interpretation of it. So slowly, and then you could see sort of evolving, uh, uh, you know, 2017. This is not 2022, but <coughs> we are sort of, the, the field sort of converged in the graph representation also as a graph neural networks evolved in data science. We sort of met um, in between uh, the key, the key, uh, uh, whatever. Um, because if you look at um, the data at multiple level being uh, detector, you know, this, uh, for example, in the tracking detector that records those uh, red dots, uh, then you can put those dots in, in a loosely connected graph, and then, and then you have a graph that you can learn something on, uh, what are the connections that are real and not not. And you can do this also with calorimeter cells, where even though you have like a non-homogeneous uh, geometry of the, the, the cells along the particle uh, 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 progress in the detector, you can still put any of the energy deposit onto a graph, loosely connect them by uh, v, you know, proximity and whatnot, and then you have a graph representation of your data and do something on it. Um, now, if you have uh, at higher level, uh, and I'm just going to start with this. For example, here we have like uh, three jets that were coming out, so it's three spray of particles, and then you can put uh, each of the spray in a graph. We're putting all the particles that you collect it in the cone onto a graph and then start to learn things, uh, maybe association substructures within this graph uh, if there is any substructure for the jet. So at all level, and also if you look at the uh, events with very high level features where you've uh, clustered things and you're just looking at a jet with a collective uh, features of particles, uh, then you can really put all those into, into a graph. It is a bit less natural, but still you can do it and then learn things from this graph. Uh, so at almost all level, except the raw data, um, then you can put the data representation to a graph or a set. Well, a set is a graph that with, with no connection, but anyways. Um, so that, that's where uh, we sort of converge onto graph uh, representation. And, uh, although many of the things can happen at the image-based, uh, image sequence-based, most of everything actually happens at the graph level based, which is also um, super exciting. Um, another aspect, um, as you know, in, in, in science and physics, uh, symmetries and invariants are essentially everything. Um, so we have to keep those in mind while doing uh, doing physics, uh, doing uh, doing machine learning for for science. And early on, um, um, as I was saying, for jet jet tagging here, for example, do you have uh, an initial uh, pattern that was coming like this, or an initial particle coming here and then just decaying? If this particle was uh, more boosted, uh, meaning that has more momentum in the forward region, or in the forward uh, direction, then well, the decay products will just collimate along the uh, along this direction, but the the object is still the same underneath, except for the momentum, of course. Um, so, if you're looking at those two particles, uh, those two jets here, to determine the characteristic of of the initial uh, 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 mother particle, then you have to tell your model that this is exactly the same as this. It's just that there was a transformation. So the boost transformation is one of the initial symmetry and invariants that we want to put into the model. Now, of course, uh, in uh, uh, azimuthal and pseudo-rapidity uh, coordinate, uh, you have uh, almost uh, uh, rotation invariants. Uh, the decay product of those two can just like decay like this or like this, at, uh, at, uh, and, and this is exactly the same. So you have to tell the model also this, the same as that a cat is the same as if it's it like 
on the side or uh, standing up, uh, although it, was, it would most of the time be lying down. Um, so this kind of, of, of invariance has to be, to be put in, 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 in the model, and that's where inductive bias is happening, where you just don't take a fully connected model you say you tell yourself, well, the, f the, the image that or the data that is going to come in has this type of inference. So the model has to know that uh, if I rotate the picture, all the activation functions downstream need to be exactly the same. Um, so there is a couple of early work, and 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 this is still ongoing. Um, uh, probably the, here they, they should update a bit the reference here with uh, having Lorentz boost, so this boosting, uh, 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 boosting of particles forward, then they hear, the model here knows that uh, it, and learns what is the internal boost of the particle so that to, it bring it all down to the same uh, representation. Uh, the deep set here uh, learn, uh, uh, used uh, some of the um, in, uh, Necessarily in necessity for invariance uh, in, in jet physics to uh, to build this uh, this set base um, method to do jet classification um, and a bit similar here with the uh, Lorentz group invariant equivalent uh, work um, and there is much more actually uh, 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 nowadays. But again, um, as soon as you know that there is a, a symmetry uh, in, in, in your data um, that you can formalize, having it, uh, telling it to the model is, is a good thing and we'll get uh, to have a model that, is less that has less parameter, that will train better, and probably at some point you can actually extract information from it by probing this uh, internal information that you've, uh, that you've um, formalized. always easier than it done. If you manage uh, to do so, then, then that's, a, that's a good thing. <coughs> um, one of the pitfall why deplo deeply developing uh, machine learning is, is uh, applications is bias to the data that, uh, that you've shown to the, uh, to, to, um, to the model during training. And here, this is uh, one thing, one, one, uh, it has one particular label to it. Uh, it's called the correlation because essentially, <coughs> let's say that you had, uh, you have a data uh, signal background classifier, but while you apply this classifier to select um, uh, uh, the signal, then uh, the background that you've selected using this, uh, this classifier is actually taking shape uh, with a shape that is similar to what uh, the signal would look like. And if, if you do so, then essentially uh, you end up with, uh, with a very biased final sample where you use your, uh, your classifier to select the events and the events from the signal in the background look really alike and you cannot do any differentiation anymore. So, this was uh, this is tackled in, in many various ways, um, and actually there was uh, a, um, a review of multiple methods, my atlas, uh, similar things done by the CMS, and actually the best one uh, uh, that I know of is is uh, this uh, Disco. Um, Greg always come up with uh, very uh, nice names uh, for distance correlation method, where essentially you really put in the loss function, a term that says you want no correlation between the variable that you uh, that you uh, that you learn from, and and uh, and here, so something that to to keep an eye that maybe uh, you have uh, the best uh, the best uh, classifier that you can think of, but it's going to shape some of the background and some of the some of your distribution in in a very bad way for for analysis. So something to keep an eye on. Um, all right, let's move on. Um, systematic uncertainty and uncertainty in general is something that always come back discussing ML applications for high energy physics. Um, there's no reason it doesn't come back here now. 
um, something to keep an eye on. Um, um, systematics and uncertainties are things that affect the data uh, uh, um, and, and that, that you sort of have ways to control and estimate downstream of analysis, but then uh, you have usually have models that are not aware and not robust against those systematic uncertainty, and you have to, when you propagate the uncertainty, sorry. Nope. Right. Um, when you propagate the uncertainty through the machine learning models, then this could blow up and get into, uh, uh, you, you got a uh, large improvement in signal background uh, prediction with the ML, but then the systematic uncertainty is just blown up, and then you lose all the performance because you have a much higher uncertainty on the measurement. So because of this, people have tried to develop m methods that are either making the model robust against uncertainty with this pivoting, um, essentially telling the model don't correlate to another me uh, um, um, don't correlate to another uh, feature. Parametrized learning allows you to put directly uh, the systematics modification into the model and tell uh, and be able to profile it out in, in a much nicer way uh, during analysis. And inferno here is actually inference aware where the you try to make the classifier or the the final analysis ML model being fully robust and then and, and aware of the possible uncertainty and then go around it completely and, and have much better performance. So something to keep an eye on. Also a lot, uh, uh, a lot of uh, literature on this. Sort of related but completely uh, domain dependence is when you train on simulation where you have lots of, uh, you, have, you know the labels, you can generate a large number of, of samples from the simulator. Now the simulator is not always as accurate as the data and not as accurate as we would like to it to be. So there is always a data Monte Carlo or data simulation discrepancy that essentially destroy somehow the performance of the model. You could have a very good classifier on simulation, but then when you try to go to try to estimate the performance on data, then you see that there is a huge degradation and maybe some large uncertainty going from one to the other. And that's sort of what uh, you can observe here, uh, where you in the the there is a, you know, in the training region, um, I have to remember, oh yeah, okay, so here that's without this, uh, this uh, domain independence method where you have a domain adversarial uh, training method, essentially do you have the, Monte the simulation, the, 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 the full histogram, and then the dots are the data, and there is a residual difference here with a certainty, and if you train simultaneously on the simulation and the data, telling the model or presenting the data and the simulation at the same time to the model, saying like, try to not make any difference between the two, then actually get to a place where uh, you get similar performance in terms of uh, accuracy in predicting or re energy regression. But the difference when you, uh, when you look at the data and the simulation now is much lower because you told the model, don't be uh, so sensitive to, uh, to, to the difference. And that, you know, that's... That you can, uh, that, that's something you can uh, achieve with, uh, with this uh, domain adversarial training methods. Um, we talked about model inference already. Uh, maybe no need to go too much into, uh, into it. Um, just to say that if you don't have access to a local accelerator, there's now ways to uh, uh, efficiently access uh, remote accelerators. Um, and also, when you go into specific hardware, you might want to do pruning or quantization of the model. Um, for neural networks, something that has been, uh, has been shown and, and, and known early on is that uh, if you have a fully connected model, um, realize that um, there is a bit of an overshoot here, and most of the weights are actually not really needed for the final model that you're going to use. That's also part of why dropout is actually so efficient. Um, 
but essentially here there is a way where you just uh, train the model and then you look at what are the weights distribution and then you just cut out everything that is too small and then just blank those nodes out, retrain a bit and so on and so forth and then you end up with a model that has only a handful of the initial nodes and connections taken into account with the same accuracy eventually. So there is a bit of a knowledge distillation by um, um, teacher students set up where the student has much less nodes and connections than the early one. Less uh, nodes and less connections mean less computation. When those are fully serialized, that has an effect. When it's fully parallelized in GPU, that it's not completely uh, advantageous. When you look at uh, FPGA implementation, then, then this can have an advantage. All right, am I doing this? No. Oh, there's, it's the five minute alarm. All right. Um, all right, you can also do the same with model compression where, um, at this time I can't remember what is done there. Um, what's the difference, compression? Oh yes, you can uh, quantize, no, quantization of, of, of the nodes. You realize that the activations here, you have a full float, a full double float uh, range for a numerical uh, representation of your activation. People realize that with only 16, uh, 16 or a couple of bits uh, representation of the internal activation function, you can ex get the same, um, the same performance, even going down to binary representation or ternary representation of the weights and the activations in the internal nodes, you can get to the same performance. And again, here, less computation, less, uh, no, uh, less uh, numbers to, to take into account, uh, faster, uh, first, faster inference. Um, another key aspect, but I've been in this course already, um, is the simulation part. Um, and here there, is mul there are multiple ways of going from, uh, uh, again, to, to simulate the data going from, um, from, the, uh, from the nothingness into the representation of, of, of the data. Um, one key aspect, uh, connecting to the question that was asked uh, very early on um, about the various ways you can do this, uh, you can do this end-to-end -end or actually doing suiting model where you start from what was generated in a very uh, cheap way uh, as a physics process and then suit those particles with everything that would happen during analyzation or, or interaction with the, uh, with the, with, uh, with the material, the uh, electronics, going down to the reconstruction chain and seeing what, what uh, the analysis would look at. Uh, so you can do this, uh, that's what is called the shooting model where you start from the generator information and you try to predict what is the analysis level information. And that is much probably a better way to, uh, to, to converge because um, you don't have to learn and generate the physics in the first place. But only all this transfer function from atomization, detector, uh, interaction, uh, uh, detector um, electronics and reconstruction. Okay, and one thing that I wanted to, to want to point out um, is the statistical power of a surrogate model and generative model. One thing you can ask yourself right away when uh, you know you have like ten thousand events uh, from the full simulation, very expensive simulation. I have only this 10,000 and I train a generative model on it, um, then I can ask myself, uh, well, I've trained the model and I can produce samples. The best you want to do is actually produce a sample that is much larger, right? Because otherwise you just take the 10K and then go away with it. You've spent the time already. Um, you can always ask yourself whether you can transfer to some other things. That's not the question here. Now, early on, people thought that um, generative model would not be able to produce statistically independent samples of larger size, meaning that you have 10K to train, you can produce more than 10K and have something that is statistical, statistically significant. But this has been shown that with enough capacity in the model for training, um, you can train a small size and generate much larger samples than the training size. Uh, and still, look, it will look like if it was coming from fully statistically independent generation from the uh, large simulation. So 
um, generate, gen generative uh, uh, models uh, will work for, 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 for those cases where you can produce more than, than what you use for training. An important uh, point to verify when you do generative model uh, development. Make sure, making sure that you can do more than what you, you started with. Otherwise, well, there's no. Um, I'm probably going to skip over this uh, just to say that uh, um, key aspect, we're sort of like gone to the beginning. Um, anomalous events and not knowing where we're going. Well, we know where we're going, but uh, there is a lot of uh, different models and doing anomaly detection. The, uh, the literature here is, uh, is one uh, paper from last year. Uh, and actually, it's the, the uh, uh, unsupervised uh, methods. Uh, and all of those are actually single paper in itself and methods for doing anomaly detection in high energy physics. This is extremely vibrant and, and uh, going somewhere. Uh, there was a recent paper from uh, a result from Atlas on implementing this in a search. So getting into, into the into reality. Interpretability. Um, I've said this already many times. Just want to uh, illustrate this with, uh, with, with this plot um, where the reference is missing, but <clears throat> where deep learning essentially gets you a, a better practical result, but then the, you know, you've lost a lot of uh, the, uh, the, the, the thinking about the science and physics that, you, that you're doing. Now, you want to go back up with a more, uh, more understanding of what's happening during the ML. It's good that it gets you forward and further with the physics, uh, with, with, the, with, the, uh, with the science. Now, you want to also inter in, in, interpret and understand what's happening. Right, I said this. And I said also many words about taking controls. This applies to detector, accelerator, uh, actually triggering, uh, but also this really, I like this uh, diagram of the uh, computing grid. This is the network, representation of the network worldwide um, between, uh, between all the various uh, internet nodes worldwide, which we could take advantage uh, or take better control of with, uh, with, uh, with deep learning and, and, and control and whatnot. Control theory. All right, wrapping up perfectly on time. Um, if there was not uh, so many questions, <laughs> but it's good. Um, physics at Collider is computing intensive, um, mostly pattern recognition, uh, but the simulation is, is also something that you can replace with, with AI in, in parts. Deep learning uh, uh, as, um, as a potential for uh, boosting science, and, and uh, we've seen many of those, not only in particle physics, but any other fields of science and anything that you learn here, you can uh, replicate and use in any other uh, fields of science to a large extent. Um, doing things at the collider in high energy physics, there is a couple of particle aspects that you need to keep an eye on, while keeping an, an eye on, on general aspects for doing good, um, good, uh, good machine learning. Um, and essentially, just uh, finishing uh, with uh, saying that you know it's the youngest one that uh, will make a difference in this field, not uh, older people like me. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I can take more questions. Yes, sir. Don't. Uh, sorry, I'm pointing you out, but if you have questions, do one. Uh, I have a bunch of them, but I think I will ask you. Like, oh, I ask yeah. ask two. <laughs> All right, anyone else, questions? All right, then dismiss, thanks. <laughs>